All right, guys, welcome. So this is gonna be my first attempt at getting you guys this. Um, so the first lesson I gave you guys over this week was um, government powers, and it literally should pick up uh, based off of Thursday's assignment that I gave you guys. So let's go ahead and begin. So your warm-up question, guys. Define the following terms, express power, reserve power, and concurrent power. And those are some that you should have picked up off of Thursday's lesson when you guys were looking in your textbook. And then now, giving them to you guys. Um, express powers, powers that are granted and given to the federal um, government. Uh, but this is um, permission that has to be given. Reserve power is a power um, that belong that belongs with the states, and then concurrent powers are powers that are shared by both the state and the federal government. So, guys, first example of express powers would be the power of the national government as it ex as it is expressed in the Constitution. Reserve powers, guys. Those, these are powers that are reserved for the state. And um, if we were in class, I would have asked you guys to look in the textbook to look at um, what the textbook says about the Tenth Amendment. Unfortunately, since we cannot, I'm gonna. I wrote it down for you guys. So it says, as federal activity has increased, so too has the problem of reconcil uh, reconciling state and national interest as they apply to the federal powers to tax, to police and to um, regulate such, to, to have regulations such as wage and hour laws. So it's a lot of it's a it's a lot of verbiage for basically to say that uh, so guys essentially what this says is that um, as the years have gone by since the constitution was originally made uh, there's become like a different blur of lines based off of like how much the federal government should tax like the police and to regulate things such as the wage and hour laws because not all states have the same cost of living for example since we all lived in california uh, you guys could ask your parents ask any adult that pays bills how much more expensive it is to live in california than it is to live in um, outside of california in a state like let's say um oregon and even not just at a state level, but on a city level. At a city level, some cities cost more. That's why some cities, even though it may just be crossing the street here, like between Upland and let's say Ontario, the minimum wage is going to be higher in Upland because it's a slightly cost a slightly higher cost of living. And as you move towards LA, LA is already maybe two dollars over where it is, let's say, in Upland or in Ontario. Okay, guys, now concurrent powers. These are powers that are shared between state and the national government. And I have a little video for you guys, but I'm going to have to link it in the description for you guys to look at because I might not be able to get it to play on this. So I'll show that one to you guys a little later. Now, guys, your closer for the day for this lesson was to provide one example of an express power at the national and federal um, level, and then provide one reserve power, which is one state, and then provide one concurrent power. And then I can help you give you guys examples of this once you guys message me if you guys are confused on it. But when it comes to these, like for example, especially at the state level, think about the difference in minimum wage in different areas. When it comes to concurrent power, think about labor laws. Could you work more than eight hours in one state but not in the other? So think about things like this. And then when it comes to express powers, think about, let's say, the making of currency, making money. Can a state print its own money? Think about things like that. All right, guys. Now I'm going to switch this over to the second lesson that we had for um, Tuesday. All right, guys. So yesterday's lesson was on um, federalism, meaning Tuesday's lesson, 317. So on this one, your warm question, I wanted it to be, what is the public good? 
So as you guys write that down, I want you guys to think about it. Because I'm going to give it to you guys right here anyways. So I want you guys to compare what you guys think it is versus what um, your textbook says it is. And your textbook says that it is what is best for the public, or the best for its public interest. So it's kind of a vague definition. But it's also something that we could, um, that could leap for us up to debate. And we can figure out what kind of people we want to vote for that will int that will think about what the public interest is for us and how they were going to implement it. So then to the, less, the title of today was Federalism and the Public Good. And then federalism is simply power sharing between federal, state, and local governments. Um, I did say simply, this is what it is, but trust me, it can get very complicated. All right, guys, so central authority. The federal government is the central authority. Um, they promote the public good through laws, and the laws that they have to follow are laws like the Bill of Rights, Environmental Protection, um, things like that, right? So they overall, they have overall protections for us that um, at a state level they cannot do, that like a state can't make some of those laws because of how the Bill of Rights is structured. And all right, guys, moving on. So promoting more of the public good, the, the distribution of power um, promotes public good in many ways. Um, and with that said, one of the good things about it is that states can find unique solutions to their problems. So it's a simple, not one size fits all solution. Um, and that's because, um, so let's say, for example, in California, there are so many of us that live in California that we have to have, let's say, stricter um, smog emissions. So at, um, every so many years, you have to go to the DMV, pay your tags, and then you have to do a smog check. And you have to pass a smog to do that. Because we have so many people living in California, if no one cares about smog emissions, we're going to pollute our air even faster than it's already becoming polluted. As opposed to, let's say, a state like Oregon. In Oregon, there's not as many people driving around, so the DMVs are structured differently, and so are their smog emissions. Since there's not as many cars on the road, they don't have to be as strict as, let's say, us in California, or let's say some uh, like the, you know cities in New York and in San Francisco, which are the most expensive ones. Um, and then one benefit to this is that distribution of power discourages abuse of power. And so let's say the government can't take advantage of certain states, and the states can't take advantage of um, strict things that the government might want. Alright guys, then local governments retain a large degree of autonomy and independence, meaning that people can make decisions that affect their lives at, let's say, now a city level. So um, let's say a state of California could have certain things. Like I said, maybe Cal Los Angeles County has, let's say, $15 an hour. But over here in Upland, it, it could be like $12 or $13 an hour because it's not as expensive to live in Upland as it is to, let's say, as you move closer to Los Angeles. So because of that, at a city level, we can vote for representatives that represent most of us that live, let's say, for example, in Ontario. Because people who live in Ontario have different needs than people that live in Upland and then people who live in Los Angeles or even the most, most expensive city, San Francisco or Sacramento. So, like people in San Francisco, Sacramento, they're going to vote for representatives that reflect them. Us in Ontario, we could vote for representatives that um, will benefit us and the, the interests that we have based off of living in, in um, a city like Ontario. All right, guys. Unfortunately, this is the discussion we would have had um, as a class, but I haven't really decided how we're going to work on this. So we'll skip this one for now, and we'll transition over to your closer. So the closer that I want you guys to have is, how does the government promote the public good? Provide specific examples. So think of all the examples that I gave you guys. Think of like our location where we live, and think about um, benefits, let's say um, wages, wages depending on the city. So think about things. You think about things like that as you provides me some specific examples, so that I can check our notes once we return to class.
Other than that, guys, I will have another lesson for you guys uploaded tomorrow. And if you guys have any questions, please message me or send me an email. Please, guys, have a nice day.